So welcome back, everybody. Uh, our next speaker will be introduced by Vic Nanda. Uh, Vic did his undergraduate degree at Caltech and uh, then did his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins University before he did his postdoc uh, at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he came to us uh, from there. And uh, he is uh, the main leader of uh, Theme One uh, and is a protein designer by trade. And uh, basically he gives me instructions on what to make. So he, he designs the proteins and I am the, the, the guy that helps build them in my lab. So on, onward and upward. All right, thanks, Paul. It works out pretty well. I think it's a great relationship. Um, so we're gonna switch gears now from physics to chemistry, which I guess is really just applied physics. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gonan Ashkenazi. Uh, I've never met Go uh, Gonan in person before, but I've been following his work for, for many years, uh, very interested in the work that he does. Uh, he did a PhD in organic chemistry at the Weizmann, and then a postdoc at Scripps with, I. I'm pretty sure uh, Reza Gadiri, because that's uh, the work of his that I'm familiar with. Uh, and he's really been a leader in modeling autocatalytic cycles and proteins, making model systems of networks of interacting peptides, uh, in, including you know helical peptides, you know during his postdoctoral work, and now very interesting work with amyloids and AP peptides. Uh, he currently is the head of systems chemistry laboratory at Ben Gurion University where he's the professor of chemistry and also head of the department. Um, he has served in many sort of, he has served astrobiology in, in many different contexts, including chair of the Israel Society for Astrobiology and the Study of Origins of Life, uh, vice chair of the European COST action group focusing on the emergence and evolution of complex chemical systems, and co-chair of the first Gordon Research Conference on Systems Chemistry. So Gonan, thank you so much for speaking to us this evening after such a busy day. Looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I'm really happy to be here. Actually, right before all of this uh, COVID-19 thing started, we spent half a year not so far from you in New York City. I should have used this time to visit Rutgers, I, I think, but in any case, we, we can meet now online and talk about science. Okay, anyway, to come to, to my talk to the science, during the talk, I describe you the systems chemistry of peptide networks. This is the very, very general title. The, the main part of the talk will be devoted to two different systems. One is the, the, where, that, where, we can, where we follow <coughs> the selection, we follow the, the selective production of certain compounds within, within mixtures of either peptide only or mixtures of nucleic acid peptide assemblies. Yeah, you'll see how I how we develop this. What is systems chemistry the way I see it? So the systems chemistry is an attempt to try and slowly mimic the chemistry that takes place in cells. So if we compare, uh, uh, let's say traditional chemistry or all time chemistry of isolated reactions where molecule A plus molecule B in presence of a catalyst, for example, will produce a molecule C. This kind of chemistry is completely different than the chemistry that takes place in cell. As we know it, that in the cell at each time, all, all the co many compounds present there at each time and each process come into place according to the cell life cycle, according to triggering and so on. And how do we do it? How do we for, try to develop the systems chemistry? We use the organic synthesis that we know, supramolecular chemistry that is now very well developed. And we add three new components. One is that we study multi-component networks, so networks of many different molecules. The second is that we uh, induce, or let's say uh, design or uh, offer the system the possibility to, go, to undergo self-organization. And the third component is that which we started not so uh, long, long ago, is to study these systems when they are out of equilibrium. And what we are looking for actually in this system, in taking these baby steps towards mimicking living cells, what we are looking for are these emergent properties. The, the term emergence is of course quite elusive, 
But the imagined properties are those properties that, that uh, come up from the system as a whole, from the network, but cannot be associated with uh, individual components uh, present in this, in this mixture. So this is what we are looking for, for this uh, network behavior that is difficult to find with, a, with simpler linear reactions. In the past few years, we, we wrote several review papers on these topics. And the main questions that we ask there is first of all, how did life begin? I, I can assure you that you will not have an answer by the end of my talk about how life began. How life began. And the second question, which is more feasible, still very, very challenging, can we synthesize life? But on top of this, we have a more realistic question that says, can we benefit from this living technology? So along the way to develop, to synthesize new cells or to, to, to synthesize the first artificial cell, we take these, uh, like I said, these baby steps where we develop new technologies that can be useful for, for different aspects of science. And this is, so in any way we can gain from this kind of study. And what I would like to discuss today in the, in the, in the context of systems chemistry is this function of selection. Imagine a network function that is selection. And by selection, I mean, how can specific molecule or specific assembly can be selected in a complex mixture, in a mixture that contains many more molecules competing for resources, competing for application, for application processes and so on. I'll go through a short introduction to peptide replication. Then the first system, the first more advanced system I would describe will be, uh, will be the uh, system that gives, that give rise to selection in beta sheet replication networks. I'll switch gear to a more, uh, let's say more elaborate system, which is DNA peptide chimeras, where we'll see examples of self-assembly and also a very recent work that we did for self-replication and selection due to replication. Okay, as a, as a very brief introduction from undergrad course, I want to remind you that uh, all living organisms copy their DNA, and this is the basis for inheritance. During this uh, DNA, uh, the, the replication, each strand, so each strand of the original DNA serves as a template for the production of complementary strands. So this is what we would call semi-conservative replication. We'll see later on an example from with our conjugates for the semi-conservative replication. But I also want to uh, point to, to your attention that this picture is actually deceiving because they, in order to really get a synthesis of DNA by, poly, by uh, in order to get this DNA replication, we have to enhance their production by the DNA polymerases. We need a quite sophisticated cellular proofreading and error checking machinery and so on. So actually the, the much better picture would be the, this one that shows the DNA replication and many other, and many other uh, features, many other molecules that involve in this process. And now if we want to try to start mimic this process in with the synthetic system, we have to go to, we have to apply a much simpler picture, a much simpler uh, uh, process. And the process that I show here will go throughout the entire talk. This is the, what is called non-enzymatic minimal replication. And with the non-enzymatic minimal replication, or usually what we see is a full length template molecule. It can associate with two, sh with two uh, shorter molecules. In this case, an electrophile and a nucleophile, which will form non-covalently, this intermediate complex non-covalently. The, the, since the electrophile and the nucleophile are in close proximity, they can react to form a new molecule. If this molecule is the same as the mother, as the mother molecule, as the template, then this process is autocatalytic. And if this process is, uh, is sequence specific, then we would call it self-replication. And of course, this complex can break into two new molecules and the second one can also get into a, a replication cycle and the process continues. And the minimal self-replication was used to study basic principle in autocatalysis as amplification tool. So if you have a molecule, you can amplify its existence through this replication. And also for information transfer in supermolecular systems, what we call chemical networks. And this is what I'm going to discuss. The minimal replication system has been demonstrated for a different kind of molecules for DNA, RNA, peptides, what we do, and for uh, also with organic 
abiotic systems. As a, as a side route for, for the talk, I would like to, to use two slides to describe you a system that we work for this self-replication, which is based on coiled coiled protein motif. Okay, so I'm sure that people working with proteins know this coiled this double helix coiled coil motifs. In, in this case, the uh, the dimer, the double helix, is the template for association of electrophile and nucleophile, and for the production of a new molecules uh, via uh, autocatalysis or self-replication. But in this system, we can also catalyze the formation of another mutant. So in this case, the green, the, the green product is just, just differing from each one of the, of the coiled coil sequences by one or two or several mutations. So this is another peptide of the same length, but with a different sequence. And so, so we can form here new product via autocatalysis where Red molecule will form a red molecule, and we can also do it via cross catalysis, where a red molecule will form another molecule, for example, the green molecule. And you can imagine that if we combine all of these together, we can now form a network where each molecule, where the molecules of the network can catalyze their own formation or formation of another molecules, and we can form something that is, may, is becoming more and more uh, sophisticated, more and more complex. And this is something that we studied. This kind of chemistry we studied until a few years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, was when we focused on, on this system in, in a in irreversible system forming networks. But in the last few years, in the last, uh, let's say, five years, we've started to study this self-replication system when they operate far from equilibrium. We heard, uh, of course, an excellent talk by uh, Jeremy England before system uh, operating far from equilibrium. We apply this for this coiled coil based uh, self-replication system. Uh, in one system, in one case, we, have, we, we work far from chemical equilibrium in a flow reactor. This is what you show, what you see is just a, a, a simulation modeling this system, but we also do it experimentally. And the system, and a system that work far from equilibrium in a flow reactor under certain condition, we, we, can, we can, can operate in a way that it will oscillate. So this is one uh, mode of working far from equilibrium. Another mode of working far from equilibrium, we, we follow this, the reversible formation. Instead of irreversible formation that you see here, we, we study the reversible formation of the coiled coil in a system which is con constantly fueled by a, an external molecule and uh, to keep it far from equilibrium. And we, when we keep this system far from equilibrium, it's actually will undergo what is called bistability. So depending on the route, depending on the direction that we start the reaction from, we will either get the, the what we call a low steady state or a high steady state. And this, this is an, an elaborate case with the coiled coil. So all of these examples, so this uh, very fast rushing through examples was using the uh, coiled coil, the dimeric coiled coil system as a template for, for replication. So now, now we go to the main question of, of of, of this talk, which is how how we can take even simpler molecules, simpler than the coiled coil molecules that are can almost be considered as spontaneously formed, in order to study systems chemistry, in order to develop a more and more elaborate systems mimicking behaviors that we see in the cell. I would like to to uh, pose this question in the following way. So we know from the Miller-Urey experiments and many experiments that follow that one, that simple compounds, including amino acids, can be formed spontaneously under specific condition, mimicking to the best we can the, the conditions on the early Earth. We also know from chemistry, from simple chemistry, or, or, or let's say from prebiotic chemistry, a lot of studies in prebiotic chemistry, that amino acids can spontaneously polymerize into peptides. This can, can form a form short or let's say simple, structurally simple peptides quite spontaneously via various different chemistry, for example, via this uh, N-carboxyl hydride or other activation methods. But the question, but the more difficult question that I think from, from, from the beginning, from the opening lecture that we had from Paul, also a part of the research in, in your system, 
is to actually try to explain how we go, how we go from these simple peptides from prebiotic molecules to the proteins as we know them today, to the enzymes, to the hormone, to structural molecules and so on. So this is what we would call in, in our research, chemical evolution of proteins in the lab. And actually what, what you'll see during this talk is that we, we prepare a peptide, we prepare mother peptide, very simple in sequence, very, not, not too long, very simple in sequence and start to modify. So we do, we take, we make very small modification very small modification to the sequence, but we get large difference in activity, in properties and function. So we take just one template molecule and start to mutate this template according to what we need to do. And then we will get more and more complex functionality, including the replication, which I just started to talk with. So this is, the, this is the family of molecules that we use. The family of molecules that we use are, used, are based on this peptide. This peptide has one hydrophilic phase with all the glutamic acid, one hydrophobic phase with all the phenylalanines. If we just dissolve this, in a, the, this peptide in, in water, let's say in buffered water in pH seven, what we will get are these fibers, okay? It will spontaneously self-assemble into these long fibers in the, in the, from the simulation, you see that the, uh, the fiber is a bilayer, is, is, for, is made from bilayer. In the middle, there is hydrophobic core consisting the, the phenylalanine amino acids, while the glutamic acid are facing outward into uh, interacting with the surrounding water. And we can characterize these fibers, but, or we did characterize these fibers in many different, in many different uh, spectroscopy and microscopy. Now, if we take this same simple peptide and just replace one phenylalanine, can also be done by replacing one glutamic acid with an imidazole group from histidine, we will get now a catalyst. So this will be a catalyst only after it can form self-assembly. So only after it undergoes self-assembly, only the fiber structure will be a good catalyst if we take analogous molecule that cannot form fibers, but, consider, but has the, the histidine, it will not be a good catalyst. In this example here, the cata we, we catalyze a very simple reaction, a modern reaction where we hydrolyze a thioester to get a thion molecule and a carboxylic acid. So this is a, what we call bond breaking, uh, uh, enhancing a bond breaking reaction. We can also enhance a bond, bond making reaction, the aldol condensation. I'm sure everybody studied the aldol condensation in their, in their organic chemistry classes in undergrad. So the, the, this classic aldol condensation can also be enhanced by a, by a similar peptide where now the, the terminal, A terminal uh, proline residue serves to produce the N-amine during this reaction and to, get, to, and to enhance this uh, uh, aldol condensation reaction. So we can get bond, bond breaking and bond making by the same simple peptide that self assemble into fibers. Uh, maybe beyond the topic of, of, of this talk, is that we can also uh, replace the phenylalanines by larger aromatic, oh, maybe not the beyond, the, <laughs> beyond the scope of this talk since, since many people here study electron transfer. So maybe it would be interesting. So we can also replace, we can also replace the phenylalanine by larger aromatic. And here is the naphthalene dimid, the NDI. And this will arrange itself into uh, fibers with long aromatic stacks and can enhance uh, Long range LA charge transport. We did it by, we, we characterized this by spectroscopy, but also by actual uh, conductivity measurements. So these are all functions that can be formed by, by these uh, fiber forming peptides. Another function is, of course, number four is the self replication. And how do we get self replication? So again, we take the same peptide as before, just make small modification in the middle to accommodate a ligation site, to accommodate a native chemical ligation site. So we replaced, in this case, we have other cases also, but in this, this case, we replaced the middle part for an alanine on one side and a cysteine on the other side. This way, we can pr prepare the core, their respective electrophilic group, okay? A thioester is an electrophile and a nucleophilic group with a cysteine at the end terminus, which can react to form the mother product to form peptide number one. So how this process takes place, peptide number one can self-assemble into fibers like we saw before. And now at the edges of this fiber or, or point of imperfections, it can associate 
with the electrophile and nucleophile, enhance their ligation and form a new monomer. Why is this important? Why is this interesting? Why is this additionally important in the context of the origin of life or prebiotic chemistry? So the replication was achieved using short peptides possessing only alternating aromatic and charged amino acids. So also almost the minimal alphabet we can imagine for this process. Also the replication of peptide monomers leads to fiber, to fiber reproduction. So what you don't see here is that after the fiber grow, the fiber grow due to, due to during replication, the fiber is also growing. Once the fiber reaches a certain size, it will break into two pieces. And now from two catalytic sites, we get, so, so from one fiber, we get two fibers and from two catalytic sites, we get four catalytic sites. So this is uh, somewhat related to, uh, to, to structural reproduction in biology. And the replication mechanism is similar to that of prion, prion protein propagation, but this is beyond the scope of what I want to tell you now. What is the, we, we spent a lot of time to understand the mechanism of this replication. This was really a long story, a long story that I'm uh, cutting it uh, short. And what we did is the self-replication. Uh, what we found here is that the full-length peptide, the full-length peptide can uh, uh, self-assemble into beta plate, into fibers, and finally into nanotubes. And that only the middle, the uh, this transient feature, the, the transient species, the beta plate, and preferably the, the fibers can serve as the catalyst. So the monomers are not good catalysts because they are too flexible. The, the final structure, the nanotube, also cannot accommodate the electrophile and the nucleophile, and the fiber is the main catalyst for association of the, of the uh, resource molecules and for the replication, as I explained before. All right. Now, the question that we ask is, can we use this peptide replication as a positive feedback selection mechanism. I'd like to explain you the, the problem that, that we, we faced or the challenge that we faced. So first of all, see it here. If we want to synthesize a peptide in, in the lab, if we synthesize a peptide in the lab, we would use selective coupling reactions and we and incorporate protecting group into the reactive side chains. Alternatively, if you want to synthesize, uh, if when DNA is synthesized, when DNA is polymerized in biology, like I showed at the beginning, this process is controlled by sophisticated post-replication error correction mechanism. But both the synthetic and the biological, biological strategies were not applicable to polymer synthesis on early Earth. So do, now we ask a question, can we assume that the replication of a peptide as a, positive, as a positive feedback that will allow its selectivity. I would like to dwell even longer on this question, okay? For all, especially for all of those that don't work with peptide synthesis all the time. If we follow a, a spontaneous, spontaneous oligomerization, prebiotic synthesis of amino acids, of, of, of peptides from amino acids, what, we, would, we may get, or we are unfortunately what we get, is first of all, epimerization. Some amino acids can be epimer, epimerized at the alpha carbon, especially after activation, that can be, they can be epimerized much faster. And also other amino acids with reactive side chains can react to form non-canonical backbone connectivity. So all of these are, of course, side reactions that we want to avoid. And the question that we ask is, can we avoid them? Or can we at least make a, a get a, a route, get a pathway where due to replication, one peptide will be selected over the others. And the system that we use for this is shown here. So you see here, uh, similar to the peptide we used before. Now in this case, the electrophile, the electrophile has a glutamic acid next to the thioester. Okay, so this is another carboxylic acid. The nucleophile is just a simple amine, so there is no more cysteine as we use for the native chemical ligation. And what happens now in this process is the following. The fastest reaction, when we put this into, into buffer, the fastest reaction will be cyclization of the thioester and the glutamic acid into the glutaric anhydride. This glutaric anhydride now can react with the amine in the, sorry, the alpha carbonyl or the gamma carbonyl. 
okay? And it can also epimerize, this glutaric anhydrase can epimerize at the alpha, at the alpha position. So overall from this process, when we mix together the electrophile and the nucleophile, instead of getting one product, as we always like to do, we got here for free, the, we got here for free, the native product and three isomers, one which is epimer at the ligation site and two others, which are backbone isomers reacting through the, through the glutamic acid uh, gamma carbonyl. So again, if, if you are into organic synthesis, I don't recommend you to use this way. Instead of getting with the desired product, you'll get four, the product with three side products. But if uh, for, for prebiotic chemistry or for systems chemistry, this is just a gift, right? We get for free this reaction network that we wanted to make. So spontaneously we form a reaction network. So this is our uh, playground to start and look for, this, and look for the selectivity. Before I show you the selectivity, I want to show you that these four compounds, these four products, differ one from the other, much differ one from the others in the property. And the properties you see here, for example, the, hydroph the hydrophobicity of the four compounds is different. You can see it for when you look at the HPLC retention time. The beta sheet level, the, the amount of beta sheet, or the level of beta sheet formation is completely different for these four compounds. And you can also see that the form uh, they, they also see form different uh, uh, morphology, different uh, uh, fiber morphology, all the four of them. So, so very slight, very small modification close to the ligation site and we get completely different four molecules. All of them, as I said, are formed spontaneously within one mixture. And, and, and I'm coming back to the question that I asked, can we use this replication replication processes, it doesn't have to be specific one of the processes, but a replication of any one of these molecules to form, to, to get its enhanced formation. And I, uh, the answer is yes. Okay, I'll come to the answer in, in a second. The answer is yes, what the, the native one, peptide two, which is not isomerized, uh, which is not isomerized is formed in higher distribution. It, it has its higher distribution than other compounds but I'll explain how this happens. So starting from each one of the electrophiles, let's start from the native electrophile for the simplicity, but we did it from all kinds of, from all four electrophiles. Let's start from the native electrophile. We let the system react. The faster, the faster, the fast, so someone is, someone, uh, I think that someone, someone is not on mute and I hear a, a background. I'm not sure is it okay fine I'll keep an eye out for it okay 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 great so I, I'm, I'm starting from the electrophile it will cyclize very fast to form anhydride this anhydride can epimerize to the dianhydride and now as I said each one of the four points of the four species can react to form the product so we get we get the four products what we found again after quite a long study of this mixture, what we found that if there is no, no catalytic process, we, if we eliminate all, uh, intentionally eliminate all catalytic processes, one compound, the W isomerized 2D gamma will be the one that is formed. We call it connect kinetic product, it's not a perfect term, but, but the 2D gamma is the one that is formed there if, there, if we have no catalytic processes at all. But if we allow, let's say, if we induce catalytic processes, what will happen is that peptide number two will self-replicate to enhance its own formation, but also all three other products will also self-assemble and support the formation of peptide number two. So altogether, what we get here is higher distribution of peptide number two, although in the, in the template free reaction without any catal catalysis, it was formed. Very, it was formed very slowly. So this was the first example I wanted to show you on how we can use self-replication as a mechanism, as, as a driving force, as a driving force for selection in the context of peptide-only machine. So um, I see that I have to run a little bit faster. So this is just a summary of what I showed you with the peptide-only systems, self-assembly, catalysis, by stacking to for molecular electronics, self-replication, and also now the radio stereo selective replication, uh, se se selective replication, which 
allow selection in, in a complex mixture. And I would like to, to switch gear to the next target, which is the self-assembly and self-replication of nucleic acid peptide chimera. Recently, together with the uh, two colleagues with, from, uh, with colleagues from Georgia Tech and from Scripps, we wrote a, a review where we summarized many different works in, on prebiotic chemistry. And, and, and let's say prebiotic chemistry and simple as a peptide chemistry on how peptide can react, can form new structure where, when it interacts with other kinds of molecules, when the peptide interacts with the DNA, with sugars, with lipids, with metal ions, and so on. And because we found so many different pathways after we, we learned that there are so many possibilities, we wrote this review and we call it, and we call those prebiotic peptides molecular hubs in the origin of life. So they can really do a lot of things with many different kind of molecules. And, and I would like to present an example for this study from two examples actually from this study from our group. The first one is, a, a, is you see here. So the new target for us, target for self-assembly was to study these nucleic acid peptide chimeras. You see the chimera now, the peptide part of the chimera is exactly the same as I showed throughout the talk with the phenylalanine and glutamic acid alternating, bound through a short linker to a DNA piece. Okay, and now here the red DNA, DNA oligos is, uh, oligo is, is complementary to the blue DNA oligo. And you can imagine now that we have two levels of assembly. So now one that we call uh, analog, which is just peptide, peptide interactions, so the interactions that I showed before. And on top of this, we have also the digital interaction between DNA strand or the, the, the sequence specific uh, DNA, DNA interaction. And both of them will affect the self-assembly behavior that we see for these for this structures. And we studied this system in some way that we called it to, to study some kind of, a, let's say, imaginary chemical evolution trajectory. And what was this trajectory? So we studied this system when we started from peptide only mixtures, okay? So this is only the peptide part of the conjugate. We let it self assemble. Of course, it forms fibers as we saw before. And we started to mix into this system, first of all, single strand uh, conjugates, so one of the conjugates alone, and then increasing amount of the double strand conjugates, so both co of both conjugates. And what did we see? First, we saw that with single, strong, uh, single strand conjugate or low concentrations of the double strand conjugates, we still get fibers, but they are separated due to repulsion between the uh, negatively charged uh, part of the DNA. So, so we get isolated fibers. If we see the higher concentration of the double strand conjugates, we start to see polymorphic situation where we have fibers in the presence of also of, of spherical species, sometimes attached one to the other, as you see here, organizing all kinds of different, or different ways. And if we take only the double strand conjugates, we get these nice spheres, these multilamellar spheres, where it, according to our, uh, the best we did, the best we can, the, according to the characterization that we did, that the best characterization we could do, we 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 saw we sh we show that this system is multilamellar. There are layers of peptides, DNA peptides, DNA, and so on. It's of course not very easy to to demonstrate this, but you can see here, for example, with the ten measurement that we see this onion-like arrangement. So this was this was a very nice demonstration that we can form new structures with these conjugates. We were looking also to see if we if they have any interesting properties or functions. And I remind you that interesting properties and functions would be those properties and functions that could not be associated to system containing the peptides alone or the DNA alone. Only when we have these conjugates, we can see them. And indeed, the, we saw that the, uh, in this assembly, uh, the, DNA, the DNA exhibited increased unfolding stability towards elevated temperature and pH. And also we, we demonstrated some basic function where this kind of assembly can bind efficiently and reversibly small molecule like the 
the thioflavin T that we know that binds to the peptide and also the doxorubicin that usually would intercalate with the DNA. So here we see that this has, the, the, the conjugate actually has double functional. Now I would like to discuss, to uh, go now to the last system, which is, uh, I wish I had more time, but I, I will try to squeeze it in, in, in four or five minutes to the first demonstration, I would say, first demonstration ever of self-replication nucleic acid peptide hybrids, okay? So we have in here, again, a conjugate. We have here conjugates, for example, you can see the, red, the green conjugate would be conjugate with a short peptide uh, fragment and dinucleotide. In this case, RAA, RAA would have two adenine. The red conjugate will have the same peptide with two timing. So of course, the, the, the two conjugates are complementary to each other and we can start to study self-replication and cross-catalysis, okay? So we can study uh, replication and semi-conservative replication if we wish to use the same terminology we started. And, and you see here, again, we study this ligation process between the thioester and the cysteine, easy one. And what we found in both cases for the green and for the red, we found that always, auto, so this is background, BGS background, weak autocatalysis, and somewhat stronger cross-catalysis. Again, for the other case, so as, as could be expected due to the uh, two uh, assembly levels, autocatalysis is weak, cross-catalysis by the other conjugate is a, uh, fast, uh, faster, is, better, is more efficient in enhancing this reaction. But then we went to a more complicated experiment. And in this experiment, we mixed together the two electrophiles and the nucleophile and studied what happened. And now we, we, we found something uh, surprising. In both cases, even when we seeded in RTT, I remind you, supposed to enhance a semi-conservatively the RAA, even if we seeded in RTT or RAA, in both cases, RAA was enhanced. Okay, so you see here the distribution in the mixtures, even if we see the RTT, where we get the RAA, which is the expected product, the expected faster for forming product, or if we see it in RAA, we also get the RAA is the better product. And this was really puzzling because at least naively, we thought that, the, that this system will react symmetric, symmetrically. One uh, uh, conjugate one will enhance number two, conjugate two will enhance number one, and the system will proceed this way, but this is definitely not what we see here. And we started a, a study to, to understand what's going on. First of all, we did some structural studies for this. And again, unlike what we would think naively, they form completely different structures. RAA alone will form fibers. RTT alone will, will form these small spheres, same sizes, same size as the spheres we saw before, so under below 100 nanometer in diameter. And if we mix together RAN and RTT, the system will undergo liquid-liquid phase separation and we, will for, and we will find some liquid droplets. So already here, we see why, this, the, why our system is not symmetric, why we get different behavior for RAA and RTT since they can form completely different uh, supramolecular structures. And also when we mix them together, again, we get a, a, a different supramolecular structure. So all of this uh, became more and more puzzling. We did uh, quite a lot of work with, uh, with several uh, control reactions and so on. You are in, in, invited to read it in the paper. The summary of all of, this, of all of these studies is shown here. So what we see here is that um, RTT, RTT is the red one, the red one, can be formed by RAA fibers, okay? So this is formation of RTT. RAA can also be formed by the spheres from RTT, okay? So this is, these are RTT for, uh, spheres forming RAA. But on top of this, in addition to that, there is another cycle which we call the parasitic pathway that can enhance autocatalysis of RAA by RAA fibers. Okay, so, so the, this picture show you uh, clearly why 
well, the kinetics that was, was not symmetric, was not, was not the same for seeding with the two different, with the two different templates, because RAA, in addition to being formed via the cross-catalytic pathway, which was expected, can also be formed autocatalytically and be enhanced in those ways. And the last thing I would like to show is that we can also here work far from equilibrium, meaning that we can work here in a flow reactor where we constantly feed in the electrophile molecules, okay, EAA, and the, the, we, we constantly feed in all the resources, molecules and templates and buffer and so on. Let them react in a small reaction chamber and collect waste, co uh, keep collecting the mixture over time in another system and then characterize it. What happens now is that actually we keep the system all the time here at the beginning of the reaction. We're selective, we're, 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 we're far from equilibrium, where, where the selectivity will be enhanced to its maximum. And indeed, under these conditions, with some under these conditions, we can see that uh, R, the formation of RAA versus RTT is, is even uh, uh, the selection formation is even better enhanced and we get higher than one order of magnitude formation of RAA over RTT in this mixture. Okay, so I, I really squeezed in a lot of material. I didn't know that I'll have to rush so far so fast, but by, I showed you two different examples of how we induce and characterize selection in complex mixtures, one was the one was a, a way to to form native peptide sequences in prebiotic replication networks comprised of peptide-only materials, and the other one is to show primitive selections using nucleopeptide in nucleopeptide replication networks using one a uh, nucleopeptide uh, specific chimera. I would like to, to finish here and to thank the, my students that, of course, they do all the work, students and postdoc, postdocs for this work. The, the main contributor were uh, Dr. Jayant Ananda, that is currently an assistant professor back in India, Dr. Anil Kumar, and uh, Chava Sadikhov. I want to thank these organi organizations for funding, and I want to thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe one question. Uh, so this is from Ariel, and uh, he's asking about the stereo and regio selectivity uh, experiments that you did with the um, the um, beta sheet forming peptoids. And he says, does the choice of amino acid alphabet have an effect on stereo selectivity, and would some other alphabets force a different conformation? Uh, would some impede uh, you know, these confirmations? So is, what, to what extent does molecular recognition control this process? Okay, yes, yeah. so, so this, this was part of the research. I, I, I didn't uh, show it in details. So actually you can see, for example, here that, the, that let's say the native one, the native peptide, the one that was at the end evolved is this is one that we call T alpha L with the, the the, the, the L configuration and, and, and connectivity through the alpha carbon. And you can see that this one forms the best or the, 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 the more well-ordered uh, fiber structures. The same one will also get higher beta sheet propensity. So, so it is, it, the, the molecular recognition was very important here. Yes, definitely molecular recognition was very important here. I, I, I'm not sure if the question was also referring to choosing a completely different alphabet for, for the peptide design. And if the answer for this would be probably yes, we didn't study this, but instead of, for example, instead of, the, instead of glutamic acid phenylalanine, people who take other amphiphatic patterns, for example, with lysine and valine, so, so positively charged and hydrophobe, will also self-assemble to in the same manner and I expect can also undergo self-replication and possibly selection. Um, is this a system where you think um, other types of templates like minerals or surfaces could also catalyze not only self-assembly, but maybe some kind of selection? 
because that's an that's a prebiotic scenario also that people are very interested. Yes, in. yeah. This this is this is a very interesting one. We had a pro. We we started the project long time ago, but we never we never got anywhere. More more with these helical peptides. So so you can imagine that if you can actually maybe maybe someone else did something similar to this. If you can imagine that you can stabilize this. Uh, intermediate sp sp helical species on a surface, then you can catalyze the reaction. Okay, so so uh, the, the answer is yes. So you, you can consider the recognition pattern even from simple surfaces presenting some functional group to some functional groups to interact with this peptide to stabilize, even to a certain degree. You know, it doesn't have to be perfectly stabilized to stabilize this helical conformation and, and then bring the two reactive group close together to enhance their ligation and to form new peptides. Yes, this was considered. We, we recognize that this is an important direction, but we, we, have, we haven't done anything in this, in this round. All right, Gunan, thank you so much again. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much.